We are live. What's going on, Brian Skates and Jess Plamondon? Uh, I'm super excited for our conversation today because we're going to talk about how to win multiple offers. At least that's what we plan to talk about today is how to win multiple offers. Just because we know in real estate markets across the U.S. and Canada, and by the way, I have both the U.S. and Canada represented on this call today, we know that markets are insane. So I want to have a, a casual and a candid conversation with two rock stars who are having tremendous success in terms of winning offers. Doesn't mean it's perfect. Nobody expects perfect, but just having success in terms of winning contracts when they're representing buyers in their marketplaces. And so my goal today is to kind of elicit from you your best practices. So as we get cranky, cranking right now, Brian, will you just say hello and tell folks where you are and how they can connect with you? Yeah. Hey, everyone. I'm Brian Skates. I'm in uh, Minnesota uh, in the western suburbs of Minneapolis in the Plymouth market. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Brian Skates. Uh, or go to our website at skatesrealestate.com. That's S-C-A-T-E-S -E realestate.com. Cool. We're super excited you're here. And uh, absolutely, they should connect with you. They're going to get a lot of value today from what you have to say, Brian. Uh, Jess, cool. how about you? Where can folks connect with you? Where are you doing business? All right. So I'm in Nova Scotia in Atlantic Canada off the East Coast. And I uh, I can be found at Jessica at the pipe group .ca or on Instagram at live, love, play, Halifax. Love it. Awesome. And, of course, Facebook and all that stuff too. But. And I'll tag you guys too when we actually post this. So just go to the description, click the button, and they can go connect with y'all that way. Okay. So first and foremost, give us kind of a sense of each of your respective marketplaces. Um, how competitive is it? Is it competitive across the board? Are there certain areas or price points that are less competitive? Uh, and Jess, I'll start with you. Just kind of tell us about the Nova Scotia landscape marketplace situation. Yeah. Sure. Well, we seem to be, um, we, we had really low, uh, I guess, virus rates for most of the pandemic. So there seemed to be a lot of people downsizing from some of our bigger markets like Ontario and British Columbia, nice. a lot of cash in their pockets and wanting to retire or downsize for a simpler life. So we saw a huge boom in, in our demand. Um, we have about four weeks of inventory and that's been as low as two weeks of inventory and as high as four weeks in the last six months. So it's very competitive out there. And it sounds like it's getting very expensive. You know, I live in Nashville and we've had a lot of folks coming in from California and other markets where traditionally they just have more money. And so their buying power, their purchasing power is super competitive, which makes things more complicated. It sounds like Ontario buyers are kind of showing up with more cash is what I'm getting the sense of, which yes. makes it tough cash for the true locals. Hand. Yeah, cash in hand. And they're either coming home or coming from away, but that's that's kind of the term out here is coming home. Everyone's coming home, even if you've never lived here before. <laughs> and they're coming home like, <laughs> even if it's great, like permanently, retirement or just moving there because maybe their work situation has changed or they can work for remotely or something to that effect, right? Exactly. Yeah. Right. Cool. Yeah. And All we're right. on so, the ocean. It's beautiful. I mean, most of Canada is landlocked. There's very few places that have access to the ocean and it's portable compared to Ontario and compared to British Columbia. We're still, you can still buy a family home for under $500,000 here. Although that's creepy. <laughs> still that's for that kind of, I mean, it is beautiful where you live. It's, Speaking of beautiful landscapes, Minneapolis, Minnesota too, right? I'm just kidding. It is beautiful there. I like Minneapolis. <laughs> Brian, tell us yeah. about your marketplace. Absolutely. No, uh, Minnesota is a great place to live. Um, a lot of big corporations are here. And uh, right now, inventory is it, as slim as it's ever been uh, in my 19 years in the business. Um, we are seeing multiple offers on just about any property under a million dollars. Um, you know, our medium house price in the Twin Cities is probably around 300000 So we don't have a lot of the uh, super high end uh, homes, uh, but anything under a million bucks is selling in a matter of days. Um, a lot of people are moving out of the city for a lot of reasons that you've probably seen on television. And so the suburbs all around both Minneapolis and St. Paul, more people are moving out of the city and we have a lot of move up buyers. A lot of people are asking for more space due to, I call it the, they need the COVID home office, um, you know, homeschooling, the gym at home, church from home. There's just a lot of reasons why people are still at home. Uh, even though I think the pandemic is hopefully uh, slowing down this time of year, but we have a lot of people who need more space and with rates being as low as they are, it's just driving the market. It's insane. Okay. Plus rates. Okay. Great snapshot, Brian. Appreciate that. And in your technically, are you, you're serving more suburban markets like Plymouth and those types of areas, correct? Yeah. I mean, 
most of our advertising is really the West Metro. So I call it that first tier, second tier suburb. I mean, we still do a lot of work in Minneapolis, but a lot of the work in Minneapolis is people moving from Minneapolis, moving 15, 20 minutes uh, west into the suburbs. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. And then each of you, I want to know where are you getting your buyer business from in terms of lead sources? Um, are they Realtor.com, Realtor.ca, Zillow? Are they Redfin? Are they referrals? Are they coming in off social? Just kind of walk us through where's the buyer business actually coming from? Everywhere. Ryan, Ryan or, or Jess, go for it, please. Yeah, okay. It's coming from everywhere. A lot of it is coming from uh, Spirit Influence. Then I've got some online lead generating programs that I'm using. Those generally tend to be like much cooler. They're not as excited to talk to a real life person, but it, it, it's really coming from everywhere. Okay. So some online lead stuff. Um, are there any like boost to the ground? Like prospecting is difficult if you can't go door knocking and stuff like that. But any, and I know that you have more stringent laws around cold calling or anything along those lines. Is there any other source that's coming to mind beyond just kind of online leads, stragglers and referrals pretty much? Sign calls. Yeah. Sign calls. Sign calls yes. because there's so few signs out there right now that to have a sign up on somebody's front yard is a guaranteed, you know, you're going to pick up five or six calls from that. All right. Good point. All right, Brian, how about you? Where are you getting your buyers from? Yeah. You know, I mean, a lot of it's past clients, um, but being in the business so long, sphere of influence, um, we get a lot. I do Zillow, Realtor, Trulia, Redfin. Um, you know, we're using Y Lopo, so we get their own website. Uh, we do get sign calls. We get a lot of coming soon calls off Zillow. Um, and then a lot of it's really just kind of just probably more sphere of influence and plat past clients are like the super hot, ready to go. Uh, that's probably one and two and then number three to be Zillow calls. Okay. So we're getting leads from here, there and everywhere or some paid sources, some organic sources. We're getting lots of different buyer leads. Um, Jess, you made a point a second ago that some of your folks are less willing to have conversation with you. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Well, I find if it's an online lead source, they're really, I guess they're kind of relying on the anonymity of the internet, the interweb. They, they feel safe hiding in their homes and uh -huh. they spend so much time on their computers that they're not quite ready to talk to a realtor. They Maybe they're mis, misinformed, miseducated about what a realtor can do for them. Yeah. Yeah. They're, and, they're always asking for a friend. They're never the buyer. They're, they're asking for their friend that's the buyer. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like, I, mean, like, I don't think you understand. Like, I provide a service. I will, I will help you. But I'm not going to force oh, yeah. you to buy it. And I assume, I assume they think that they're suddenly, oh, I didn't mean to get under contract. No, you're not under contract yet. There's a whole, there's a whole bunch of steps. Like, you don't even know what you're in for. We're going into the, yeah. speaking of which, let's talk. Like, so we know that markets pretty much everywhere, not everywhere, but pretty much everywhere are unbelievably competitive. Um, there are various reasons that I won't even attempt to try to name them all in terms of why the market is as backed up as it is. Suffice it to say, we have super limited inventory, uh, i.e. there's just not many listings for sale and there's buyers looking to buy. And because of that, we're seeing multiple offers all the time. And so I know a lot of agents who I'm connected with on social, um, they're struggling. Like I need some techniques and strategies to win. And mm -hmm. I guess you could be somewhat cynical or maybe somewhat realistic and say it always comes down to the price, but maybe it doesn't always come down to the price. And that's what I want to talk about today is um, share with us and we'll just kind of round robin this. Let's just kind of play tennis back and forth with ideas and tactics to win multiple offers. What's working for y'all? Whoever wants to go first, we'll just kind of go casual and just round robin. Okay, I'll start. All right. So uh, well, I, you know, a seller is just not going to leave. $50,000 on the table. So what I'm finding when I'm receiving offers is that there'll be like percentage wise, there'll be 20% of offers. So say the best, the best three or five will be very, very similar. And then there'll be a whole bunch that are not quite there financially. And I don't even care about those. I'm just looking at the top five and what's going to distinguish between winning it and not winning it is a the letter the closing date and that realtor's reputation for being a pain in the butt and ability to close. Got it. Okay. So I wrote down just to kind of take my notes, 20% of the offers are going to be in range competitive. 80% of the offers are probably not going to be close. We don't know what the 20%, what those offers are per se. Um, is there any, like, are you advising your buyer? Like, do you tell them this kind of a script or like, Hey, 80% of the offers aren't going to be that competitive. 20% will be, how do we know if we're yeah. in the 20% or the 80%? Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's a really good question. So what I'm doing before I'm even taking buyers out on the road now is I'm getting them to send me a list of their top five favorites. And then I will go and I will pull recent sales and not from, you know, six days back. I'm looking for real time last seven days in that area and showing them that house that you liked, that one that you really wanted to go see that sold for $150,000 over list. How do you feel about that? Okay. So and it's usually smart. well, we feel like we're just gonna wait for for we're just it's not the house we're gonna wait okay because housing prices aren't coming down they're right. only going one way. I was so having a conversation with, them, yes, right? yesterday. I was talking to my brother, and he bought a house last fall, and he's like, "Man, they're so expensive." And I was like, "Imagine how expensive they'll be next spring." And now yeah. he's he's counting his equity. He's like, "I can't believe how much equity I've got <laughs> because yeah. it's gone up." And I was like, yeah. aren't you glad you, you got it when you got it? Um, okay, so I think what you did is super smart. I'm gonna say it for my own peace of mind, my own sake. You're having a conversation with the buyer and you're basically reviewing past seven days of sales, assuming there are sales that could be, if you may have to go up further back if there aren't sales. And it's like, let's pretend the house is listed at 450, but it actually, this one closed at five, this one closed at 515, this one closed at 490, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So you can establish ranges. Okay, we know that comparable homes are selling between now 490 and 515. So yeah. if we even wanna have a shot at this house, we have to be in that range, right? And I assume that's how you kind of parlay into the 80-20 conversation that you were referencing. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and then you write a buyer letter. Uh, I know a lot of folks watching probably do this or know about it, but just really quick, for those who maybe don't know, what's the buyer letter? The buyer letter is like, you want the seller to want you to win the offer. It's a love you letter. You want the seller to be rooting for you. So you yeah. want to introduce yourself, talk about yourself, talk about your family plans, because the reason you're buying that house is probably why they bought that house when they bought it. Whether hey, you're Brian, starting a family. Hmm? Brian, he prints those letters and sends them with teardrops on it. So it looks really from the heart, right? Right, well, Brian? You know, we, we had an offer that was accepted. Um, on Monday and the agent said, the reason why we, we accepted your offer was not because it was the highest offer, it was because they liked the letter because it wasn't just a word document of just, hi, I'm the buyer. It, you know, my um, Corbin, my uh, assistant, you know, yeah. awesome assistant who does all the creative work for us, she created these really nice templates on Canva, on a Canva that the buyers can download and they can plug and play with their photos. It, you know, it's kind of a pre-scripted, who you are, your family, what your hobbies, your favorite, your interests are. And, and, you know, Jessica's right. You're really getting the sellers to know who you are as a buyer and to really fall in love with the idea that you're going to buy their house because it's their home and now it's going to become the buyer's home. I think, and I think that we underestimate sometimes how sentimental a home is to a seller. It's not just this thing they're ditching and leaving behind in most cases. And so to me, it's like, does the buyer letter always work? No. I mean, I bought my house. I wrote a buyer letter for my own family, it did nothing. I still got the house. They just wanted the money. So it's not gonna work all the time, no. but it does work. And when it works, like uh, I remember when I was doing sales, uh, I was writing buyer letters and I heard it too. It was the letter that made all the difference. So I think you're leaving opportunity on the table if you don't write that letter. Tell me if y'all are similar. I used to actually keep a log of all the letters that I had from clients that had worked. And so I would have my clients typically write the letter but then I could recommend some edits and some proof, mm -hmm. like, hey, you could go deeper here, blah, blah, blah here. And I had like samples <laughs> kind of stuff. Oh yeah, we've, we've used, when they when they've telling me, hey, well, why are you looking to move? Why are you looking to buy? And then they tell me their reasoning and I say, oh wow, that's very heartfelt. That's gotta go in the letter. You've gotta say that. Once the seller hears that that's why you want their house, that's pulling on their mm -hmm. heartstrings. That's an emotional pull. Um, you know, back to your techniques, I. I you know, I'm about ready to unveil what I call my seven techniques to winning multiple offers. So if there's anyone in the Minnesota marketplace that's watching this, I'm going to be really worried that now I've got to compete against my own recipe. Yeah, um, you can get, they, they owe you a referral fee. They, they are. So, you know, the first thing I like to advise uh, our, our buyers is I say, hey, let's, before we start making these offers, let's pretend like we're the seller. And I will show them as a listing agent, I'll say, hey, on the last five to 10 offers or, or listings that I've had in this area, here's what they look like. And I'll, and after they've closed, I'll give them the five to 10 offer breakdown where I'll say, this house had five offers. This offer had, this house had 12 offers. And now look at what each one of these offers were. And they'll, their eyes go like, what? And I'll say, 
look at the similarities in what the winning offers all had, and all the sim and all of them have a similarity of what I call these seven these uh, seven things. And they're going to be anything from the we talked about the letter, um, but also we have a how we did it letter, and that's as an agent. That's the love letter from me to the listing agent saying, here's why you want to choose me. Here's my track record. Here's how many homes I've sold. Here's how many homes fell apart or here's how many fell apart after appraisal after inspection to really showcase you got to choose me as well as much as you're choosing the buyer. Um, and then we wow. talk again about uh, escalation clauses, appraisal gaps, appraisal clauses. Um, we ask these sellers, hey, have you had a, um, a home inspection done recently? Maybe you bought the home two years ago and now you're selling. Can I look at a copy of that old inspection report? Because if I see that, I may not even want to do a home inspection because I may just look at the old report. Um, we also talk about doing free rent back where I'll buy your house. You know, we've all seen the big monster out there. Zillow will buy your house and then you don't have to close for 90 days. Well, we can copy that, Mr. Buyer. Let's buy their house and give them 90 days of free rent back if you're flexible to do that to have a winning offer. Um, and then the, one of the, be the best techniques that we've been using lately is we get these highest and best multiple offer deadlines. They're due at seven o'clock on Saturday. So by six o'clock, I'm texting the, the, buy, the listing agent saying, hey, how many offers do you have? Um, is there anything that my offer can change right now to stand out? You know, what would you like as a listing agent to see out of all these offers that you don't have yet? Tell me what you want and let me go give it for you. And a lot of times they're like, well, I can't disclose everything. I get that, but just tell me what you want and let me see if I can give it to you because I want to make your job even easier. You choose me and we're going to win. That's how easy this is. Let me take all the work off your plate. Choose my offer. I, I, that line is quotable. Tell me what you want and let me see if I can get it I'll for you. <laughs> That's a yeah. good line. <laughs> you can't write that out, but you can I call it. I just wrote, I'm writing it out. That's Tell me them. what you want and let's see if I can get it for you. No, and I will get it for you. That's all right. I tell all my buyers. It's free to hear no. You make the <laughs> offer. It's free to hear no. Dude, that's, that's a good line. Okay, so I'm gonna go. Th so I wrote down seven. So the first one is the letter. Oh, and I just want to go back to the 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 letter that we're yeah. that we're advising. Totally. I've had a few people write the letter, but then they don't include it as part of the offer. They're sending it in the body of an email. And so when I'm presenting sixteen or sometimes thirty two offers to my seller, those letters don't make it in all the time. This is mm -hmm. this is the summary page, the cover letter of a resume. It goes with yeah. the resume, right? Yeah. And it has, you have to check the box saying other letter of introduction or whatever. Oh, you literally, it is, it you make it an addendum to the actual contract. I make it an addendum. <laughs> You're not messing yeah. up. So that way I know that the seller read it. Wow. Yeah, I, I've not made it as an addendum yet. We just make it as one large PDF. So whenever they open it up, it's there. And it's usually the why choose me letter, then it's the Pre, then it's the who's the buyer letter, then it's the pre-approval letter, and then it's the full purchase agreement. Because I know in my marketplace Both. that the yeah. the agent, the listing agent has so much of an opinion on which offer to choose. When I'm sitting in front of my sellers and there's 31 offers and they go, gosh, which one would you choose? How right. often do you get asked, well, which one would you choose? Because most sellers care about how much money do I get and how quick do I get it and which one's guaranteed. I want guaranteed money. I want guaranteed certainty. I want to make sure if I sign this one, Brian, that this is the one that goes through. And so that's how I portray my offer to the seller, which is when I'm trying to win, it's going, hey, choose us. It's guaranteed. It's going to happen. You're going to win if you choose our offer. Yeah. And so I want to, so I want to talk about that. I've, I've called that in the past a buyer or agent report card. You're calling it a how mm -hmm. we did it, but it's basically yeah. a report card on you're not just picking this buyer, you're picking the representation too. And here's my track record so that you can have some confidence. And, and Jess, I know that you guys with Sandra Pike and your team do this too. Um, yeah. Having some kind of a report card that you say, I'm not, I'm not a loosey goosey agent without a track record. My reputation is part of this because my future business is somewhat predicated on my ability to navigate these difficult transactions and to be a reliable, a reliable outcome. Right. Um, I've joked yeah. with uh, some of my clients before. I'm kind of like, kind of like like being a seller in this market is almost like the show The Bachelor where you have all these candidates but you're only picking one and the one you pick is supposed to be the the full distance right and so I'm thinking about the buyer you pick the agent you choose to work with that's the one 
with whom you're going through the due diligence. And so there's just an element of, I think if nothing else, the report card at least makes the listing agent have a moment of pause and go, I never thought about it like this. <laughs> I've never seen another report card yet since I've had all of our listings in the last two years. Um, and I get more comments from agents that go, what a great idea. Why haven't I ever thought about that? And I say, well, I didn't think about it, but my business coach did. So I'm just, you know, R and Ding it. And, and it's just fantastic. Cause once they see it, they go, well, this is fantastic. And I go, yeah, that's why you want to choose me. I'll be really easy to work with, you know, super good. When I'm a listing agent, I would say, and I get on average seven to 15 offers on most of our listings. And that's within 24 hour period. At least a third of the offers are incorrect. There's a typo. They've checked two boxes that contradict each other. The agents who are doing these letters or, or doing these offers, a lot of them just aren't proofing their work. And I sometimes I look and go, man, I feel horrible for this buyer. They have no idea. It's not my job to be the babysitter and to go back to the agent and say, you need to redraft your purchase agreement. You've done it's it great, wrong. It's almost like when you're doing a, a job hunt on Indeed and you all of a sudden, you, you do your job posting and you get 50 applicants. And now you're like, ah, I need a quick way to scrub through this list and scan and find the good ones from the bad ones. And so you start looking for base like typos and things like that. I, I mean, I know that you have a fiduciary responsibility to show all offers to a seller, and we do. but it certainly doesn't bode well when there's, when there's typos and grammar errors and things. And, and especially when there's a, an inherent contradiction in the contract, because who yeah. wants to go back and try to correct that when there's 50 other offers to pick from? I think, yeah, if, time. I think if a consumer is watching, they should say, when was the last time you proofread one of my last 15 offers we've submitted? <laughs> to their agent. Because I think the temptation as a buyer agent is, yeah, here's another one. Let me just throw it and see if it sticks. And you get in a hurried state and that's not productive long-term. All right. So the letter, um, Jess, is there anything else you want to add to the letter strategy? Uh, no, I, th I think the letter strategy, I, that you would be it? my biggest one is to include it as part of the offer. Okay. You know, it's, it's funny. I'm thinking about, I don't know if this relates or not, but I'm, we're live. So I'm going to talk about it anyways. Um, Tom Ferry had a uh, Ken Carey come speak at an event here recently. And Ken Carey is like the king of direct to consumer marketing. And he went through the five questions to ask a consumer. That is the ultimate outline for getting a review or a testimonial from a consumer. And the first question I'm going off memory was why'd you choose Brian's gate or sorry? No, it was why'd you choose to buy a home? The second question would be why'd you choose Brian's gates? The third question would be, um, how did Brian Skates help you with your problem or help you do the thing you wanted to do? The fourth question is, um, uh, it is, oh, come on, what was the outcome of the whole thing? And the fifth question is, what would you say to somebody thinking about hiring Brian? You could almost modify those questions for your buyer letter and say, why are you choosing to buy this home? Okay, um, why this home? Or why are you buying a home? Why this home? And then you could be like, um, you could probably, I don't know, I'm just, we're live. I'm thinking about it out loud. But I think coming up with a baseline structure of how we make these letters so that you can turnkey them is not a bad idea for folks. I've I know that few, kind of fizzled out, but whatever. I've had a few buyers, um, agents actually send like a bomb bomb video of the buyers in front of the house, like in the front door. And they're saying, we just finished the showing. We love this house. We're heading back to the office. We're going to make an offer you can't refuse. I, I mean, that's good. That's really good. Um, I know that Krista Farr uh, from the Farr Group Northwest, she used to be during the showing, she'd have her camera going and nobody would know it. And she was like this with her camera. And the kids would be like, that's going to be my room. No, no, that's my room. I get that room up there. And then she'd do like a little <laughs> sappy music in the background <laughs> and make it. I'm like, I'm like, where, do I, where do I sign? Yeah. Okay. That's how you get your sellers. That's how you get your buyers to make decisions is you would walk into the house and say, okay, kids go choose your bedroom. And they go like excited. And you look at the parents and say, well, I guess you're buying this one. So yeah, exactly. Go. Okay. I want to go deeper on, we talked about the letter. We talked about the report card. I want to go back to something Jess said, which was, you talked about the closing date. Um, what are you doing around the closing date topic? Well, the first thing I'm doing is I'm looking at the listing card on MLS to see if they've put a closing date in. Because I get a lot of phone calls from agents asking, what is your seller's ideal closing date? I didn't take the time to put it in the cut sheet if I didn't want you to have that information. Right. <laughs> and right. I also don't want to get 55 phone calls on my seller's ideal closing date over the weekend as well. So I would say when it comes to closing date, I look, I go through the listing online. I don't do it on my phone. I actually sit down on my computer. 
go through the listing cut, read every single line, check the documents tab. I do my homework before I present an offer because I don't want to be a pain in the butt for the listing agent. I, I want them yeah. to want to work with me. To, to Brian's point about the typos and the misspellings and things of that effect, mm -hmm. taking your time, slowing down to think, and actually me putting forward a meaningful offer. That's good. Um, and I think it's smart. I mean, I'm not aware of your system exactly in Nova Scotia, but I think it's nice that the seller can say, this is the ideal closing date. And you just say, I wonder what they want to do for closing. Let's put that in the blank and see if we can make that yeah. work. Um, let's jump over to escalation clauses, Brian. You want to talk to us about how you're leveraging those? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the first thing I do, I always will ask, you know, in our market, it seems like no one answers the phone anymore but me. So a lot of it's text messages, but I will email text and then I'll call the agent, one of those three, and say, hey, are you or your broker comfortable with escalation clauses? Because not everybody is. Have you and your seller discussed it before, you know, you listed the property? So. And a lot of times they'll say, yeah, we're comfortable with it. And I'll say, great. So then I'll go to my buyers and I'll say, well, here's your options. You know, we know that in our marketplace, homes on average sell between 30 and 40,000 over asking price in almost any price range. So if the home is at 500,000, you know, it's probably selling for 540, 550. Um, will it appraise for that? Well, that's probably another topic we'll get into here. We'll get to that one. Uh, that's the next topic, but keep going. Yeah. So for the escalation <laughs> clause, it's something similar to a, hey, I'm the buyer. I'm willing to offer base price uh, $525,000 on your $500,000 listing. So I'm already giving you $25,000 over but I'm willing to pay $1,000 or $2,000 or $5,000 over the highest bid up to my threshold. My threshold is 550. So I'm going to start at 525. I'll give you an extra $1,000 over the highest bid up to $550,000. And all I need is just proof that there is another existing offer. I don't need their names. I don't need all the details. Just, you know, show me some type of proof that there is another offer out there um, and that I will match or beat that um, up to my threshold. And yeah. we've had a lot of success with that. I think a couple of things that stand out to me is first, you're reaching out to them first and saying, hey, have you discussed it? Are you and your broker comfortable with it? Is your seller open to it? I think that's smart because it is a very taboo subject for a lot of agents. I well, personally- so is, the, so is the seller, the, the buyer letter. You know, I've, I've got more agents now in the, in the public and agent remarks will say no love letters. You know, we think it's going to be it's, uh, fair housing discrimination. We don't want any love letters. Just don't send them to us. So I ask about those as well. The same with the um, uh, with the uh, escalation clause. Yeah. Yeah. And, and of course, they're right. Like, just if you're going to write letters, write it in such a way where it's not going to violate fair housing or discrimination. And I, I'm not sure exactly what the law of the land is for Canada, but I know it's similar to the U.S. here. So just be compliant, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, I think with the escalation clauses, though, reaching out first and seeing their level of comfort is super smart. I also think that it sounds like you're coaching your buyers and saying, we already know that list to sale price ratio is going to put us in this range. So we're not going to start at under asking price or at ask price. There's almost a level of being polite with the, with the seller on that level where you're willing to yeah. say, I'm willing to be on the line on the hook for this much money, no matter what, as a minimum. Yeah. I think that just kind of positions your escalation clause more favorably. It's my opinion but I think it's a very polite way of doing it. Well, we, we get a lot of offers when I'm a listing agent that they'll say, we'll give you $500,000. That's your asking price. But I'll go up to 575,000. I'll do a thousand dollars up to 575. And the seller goes, well, that's nice. And I go, yeah, but this other guy's only, you know, if they're, they're starting higher. So they have a little bit more, maybe more interest or just more willingness to buy your property. I, right. I, I just see starting at asking price and then escalating up to a really big number doesn't, favor as much in my opinion with the seller as if you're already going above to get it and then you're willing to stretch even more. I, I agree. And it's like, and just going back to the letter, if you do write a letter and then you offer ask price when nobody ever expects it's going to sell for ask price, it almost negates anything you just said on a yeah. certain yeah. level. Okay. Um, let's talk about appraisal gaps. You mentioned that as number four, Brian. Um, and then Jess, jump in here too, whenever you want. I'm just kind of going through his list of seven. Sure. Uh, appraisal yeah. gaps. What are you doing there? So for our appraisal gaps, you know, I tell all my sellers, if someone's going to give you over asking price and there's not an appraisal gap, I don't even know if it's really even over asking price because we are having a lot of appraisal issues. There's no comparables. There's no comps to do good appraisals on. Uh, and in our marketplace, when we're coming, you know, out of the winter months, there's not a lot of home sales to begin with. So it's hard to pull good comparables for these appraisers to look for. So the appraisal gap would say something along the lines of, Hey, I'm going to offer you $525,000 on your $500,000 house. 
Um, in the event it does not appraise for 525, um, I'll pay up to $10,000 or $25,000 to bridge the gap, to make sure that you're still gonna be whole, Mr. Seller, um, and that we're gonna be able to, to provide a uh, payment to buy this house. And it's really the buyer is writing a check at closing um, when they find out, or you know, a few weeks before closing, they find out that the house may not appraise for 525 or 525 base price with an escalation up to 550. And they say, hey, I'll guarantee up to $40,000 to make sure you're getting at least as close as we can to that 550 number. Um, How are you preparing buyers, buyers for that? Know, show me the money. Where's the cash coming from? And a lot of times as a listing agent, I'll say, hey, you've got to show them proof of funds, like a cash offer. You know, black out your retirement statement or your, your, your savings account and let's show them that we have that money on top of the down payment. And, and a side note, sometimes I'll take buyers that say, I'm going to put 20% down, and but my appraisal gap is part of that 20%. So we talk to their lender and say, hey, can we take that 20% and chop it from 20% down to 10% and then use the other 10% as part of their appraisal gap if we have to start using that money? Because And then if you they, don't, they, you put it back on the loan. Table, the seller gets their money, they're happy and they're walking away. Okay. So, so it sounds like based upon the mortgage conversation and using part of the down payment set aside, stashed away for the, in the event there is an appraisal gap, they can use it there. You're having quite a bit of pre-talk with your buyers even before submitting the offer about, oh, yeah. hey, we're going out to sea, but we might run into some glaciers or something like that or some ice, whatever. I, don't, I can't mm -hmm. think of the name. We're going to run into some rough waters potentially. What's our game plan to navigate through that storm? And the hardest conversation with these buyers is saying, hey, when I pull comparables, when I've looked at the market, I think it's worth 525 because that's what the market says. But I know 525 doesn't win it. It's going to be 650 that, or, or, or five, you know, 560 that wins it. And so you're going to have to be prepared to show up with some cash to cover the difference because I can guarantee you other buyers are going to have that that are going to win of that 2080 rule, you know, that Jessica talked about. 20% grab good offers. They're all probably going to have this, you know, guaranteed you're going to guarantee I, that we yeah. buy your house. Yeah. And then I'm looking here at, um, I'm going to kind of speed our pace up a little bit because I want to get some other questions and I want to leave room for Jessica to chime in with any other tactics or strategies you've used. Um, I see the one about ask for a recent home inspection because sometimes your buyers may be, be happy enough with that uh, and they may not go in with a contingency. Obviously, you know, I don't want any liability that one, in that. That one won two weeks ago for us. The buyer, the sellers yeah. had a house. Um, that they were selling. They bought it two years ago. The market was crazy. They go, hey, let's sell it again and make another $150,000. And my buyer goes, I'll never buy a house without a home inspection. I go, amen, you shouldn't. But the market's crazy. Let me ask if there's a home inspection. The agent goes, out of 17 offers, you're the only one that's asked that question. I go, great. Well, can we see it? He goes, I'll ask. They show it to us. Mm -hmm. My buyer goes, okay, this is good enough. I'll go no inspection. Yeah. Now we won. Yeah. I've done saying? that before. And then I've also said, like I, because I, well, I double-ended a deal recently where the I couldn't advise on price, and they so they emailed me what they wanted to offer and no conditions other than financing. And I said, "Well, I in good conscience, I can't I can't write that offer. There's too much liability for me." So what I do do is I'll say I'll check yes to the home inspection, but I'll also write in the notes that the purchase price is the purchase price regardless of inspection it's for personal reference only but i would never in a million years advise a buyer to buy a home without an inspection should you choose to waive that right that's your choice but i would never advise that yeah yeah we're gonna have it oh, yeah. home inspection sure. after the new firm <laughs> we have a lot of home inspections that they'll say it's not it's we're doing home inspection but it's not contingent you know to yeah. make the sellers feel like again okay well they're still gonna they're still gonna buy my house they're going to pay me 80 grand over asking price, but then they're going to come back and ask for 1700 bucks worth of repairs. I mean, that makes every seller just go like, what's going on? So mm -hmm. buyers have the right and they should always do home inspections. Sometimes they do home warranties in addition to, um, but it's crazy out there. So you have to be pretty competitive. Yeah. Well, I mean, ultimately your job is to represent the interest and to obey well, all and the insurance. And selling agents wouldn't want to waive the inspection either because then everybody's liable. Like all of our clients could come back and sue any one of us, really. Hmm. All right, let's jump to number six with the rent back. So I assume that's how do you kind of how do you kind of ease into knowing if that's relevant to them, Brian? I'll ask again. I when I reach out to the uh, listing agent and I ask questions like, "Hey, so how many offers do you have? Um, you know, what else is really important other than the closing date and the remarks that you put online? Is there anything else that you didn't put in there that you'd like for me to know?" Um, 
And then I'll, and then if it's, a, are they buying, are they building, have they already found a new home? Because a lot of that information is not on, not on our MLS, um, what the seller's uh, motivations are. And I'll say, hey, is it, do they want their money quick? Do they want their money in 30 days and they want 60 days to find a house to buy or to build? Where, where are they going? Because my buyer is living in his mom's basement or my buyer is living at his girlfriend's house. So they own a house that they're not going to sell until they buy something. So what, um, mm. what can we do to make it even easier for you to choose us? We'll so, buy it, we'll cash out. And then, you know, of course you have to hold insurance on it, but there's a lot of risk for a buyer to go buy a house and then not own it yet. I'm not a big yeah. fan of that, but some of the buyers mm -hmm. will say, Hey, you know, I'll take on that risk. If that means I get it. Well, and I think, I mean, you can also have the conversation of, can we just delay the closing date where the possession stays with the seller if they don't need their cash out right away, but they just need time to go find a place for instance. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that could mitigate the risk of the buyer a little bit. It's good. Um, okay. The last one on my list here from Brian and Jess at any point jump in is, Hey, we're reviewing offers at 7 PM on Saturday night, blah, blah, blah. Um, bring your highest and best. And you're pinging the listing agent at 6 PM saying, and I wrote down, is there anything my offer can change to stand out? Tell me what you want and let's see if I can get it for you. It's free to yeah. hear. No, <laughs> those are the, yeah, it's that's, good. That's exactly the way I say it. And you use, I'll text them. And I've had, I've had listing agents call me in the car saying I'm driving over to their house. I appreciate your call. Um, it's been a crazy busy day. Um, we're reviewing the offers and I'll say, Hey, where do I stand? And I shut up and listen. Am I in first? Am I in second? I ask, I know they can't tell me some of them do. So I ask some of them, yeah. some of them do because not all of them are sharp and they just go, Oh yeah, you're in second place. Great. Well, let me get back to my buyer. Cause we need to be in first. What would you like to hear? <laughs> what do you guys want from us? And I tell what my does it take to get in the first place right now? Give it, to them. Give it to them. If you can't, that's okay. Because yeah. I'm adding value to my buyer by saying, listen, I'm trying to see behind the curtain as, as clear as I can. If you don't want it, if you don't want that number, that's fine. But at least I'm taking the stress out of you going, well, how come I lost? Because that's every buyer's going, why did I lose? How much did I lose by? You know what's what interesting here? Did? You think about like, let's go back to a market where it was not a seller's market, it's a buyer's market. And I remember having price re readjustment conversations with sellers. We got to reduce the price. Every and if you try days, to reduce, if you try to reduce a seller's price in that kind of a market, and they don't know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you've done everything that can be done to market that property and get that sucker sold, they're going to say, "Not yet. You haven't done everything you can do." And I think we're in we're in an opposite market right now. But when you're working with buyers, it's like too many agents. I think aren't doing the level of work that each of you is doing to prepare that offer to win. And so I think it's it's easy to go to a buyer and say, you gotta ask more money. Look at the comps, the comps tell us to ask more money, blah, blah, blah. But like Brian, especially some of the stuff you're saying, the number of times you've gone to the listing agent in advance and already asked those questions, if I'm a buyer working with you, I'm putty in your hands because you've exhausted and turned every stone that can be turned over. And so I'm that much more malleable to say, look, if I want this house or don't want this house, this guy's done everything there is to be done to get me the best to, to know what I have to do. And so I'm going to be much more, I think, willing to go along with some of those recommendations. Does that make sense? A lot of times. Yeah. Well, a lot of times my buyer sitting right beside me and I'm on my, I'm on speakerphone and say, Hey, Mr. Listing agent, I've got some questions and my buyer's going like, they're hearing the whole thing. Very transparent. It's good. And I'm saying, Hey, yeah. I'm working for you, buddy. I'll do I'm that when I'm like wrapping up a showing and my clients and my buyers are, they're excited. I can tell like the, the look of love has happened. And then I'm calling the listing agent right then and there on speakerphone. And I'm saying, what can I do? What can we do? What, what, like, how many offers do you have in hand? Is there anything that we can do to make our offer more attractive to your clients? And I think both of you, like, I love the question, what can we do to make it more attractive? And both of you seem to have, like, if they can't come up with an answer to that question, you're ready to say, well, what about this? 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 Cause mm -hmm. how's our price? How's our closing date? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. All those details. Can we um, I want to create a little bit of rapport, but I don't want to get, I don't want to harass them with, you know, five or six text messages because you know what it's like on the other side. Absolutely. Of course. All right, let's, let's switch topics for just one more question for you all today. Then I'll let you go. Um, uh, what are your policies in terms of buyers? You will, this is going to be a, a very harsh question. It's going to sound harsh. Who will you, or won't you work with from the standpoint of, I, I'm thinking about my own coaching clients. I'm thinking about agents who are just, they have buyers crawling out of their ears. They have so many buyers right now. And let's be realistic. There's 1,440 minutes a day and you got to sleep and eat during some of them. We're all busy right now. 
And so there's going to have to be a level of triage applied to who can I help? Who can I not help? And I'm thinking about, I can't remember who to give credit to, but there was some speaker at some event once who said this, he was like a Coast Guard rescuer. And somebody asked him once on the stage, they're like, hey, let's pretend that you're, you arrive at a shipwreck and there's 12 people drowning. Who do you pick to save? That was the question they asked him. And his answer was, I wish I could remember who this was. If you guys know who's watching, just put it in the comments. I want to know who it is. His answer was, um, I save whoever swims toward me. That was his answer. And I was like, that's so good because right now I think about a lot of agents who are in a position of, they got so many buyers, who am I going to serve? I'm going to serve the people who are swimming toward me that I, that are willing to receive the help that it takes. Cause I'm just the messenger, the market's the market, right? So just yeah. with that in mind, what are the policies around how you're managing your business in terms of not running out of time and running ragged with buyers? All right. I think I've polished my question as best as I can. Ball's in your court. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I guess uh, you're right. You've got to pick the ones who are swimming towards you, the ones who are educating themselves on the market, the ones who are following recent sales, the ones who, the ones who, when you say, you know what, that's a really nice house. And I think that's going to sell for X plus 80,000 in our market, or, or maybe it's 120, you know, how do you feel about that? They're like, you know what, we're ready. Yeah, we're ready. Great. But if I, I, I will drill in and I will dig down until I have your 100% commitment. And if I don't have it, I'm not giving up my Saturday night. I'm not giving up time with my family because I really need to focus on bringing properties to market to fill that void. So if you're going to waste my time, sorry, <laughs> waste your time really, then True. I gotta let you go. And, and that's okay. And once I started doing that, I actually started getting more listings because I was spinning my wheels with things that were going nowhere. Sorry. Super good. Sorry, right. tell him I said hello. <laughs> it's probably a buy. <laughs> I would say our policies, it really starts with um, a quick, a very quick buyer consultation. You know, we get the lead, they come through, mm -hmm. whether it's past clients, sphere of influence, Zillow, Realtor, Trulia, whoever, I'll say, great. Uh, and they always go, hey, can you show me this house tonight? Well, before we go do that, I got a few questions and I'll run through um, a list of questions that I can determine their motivation. You know, how real mm -hmm. are they to this market? Um, have they been pre-approved? Are they willing to get a second opinion on their pre-approval if they hit an easy button on the internet? And I don't know who that lender is. Um, especially one that's not local, because um, in, in our territory, non-local lenders can be not a very attractive thing to sellers. Not that they're bad, but it's just you're trying to have I a get it. edge. Um, yeah. And then I so want that letter the, the consultation. I need to find out, you know, you know, have they looked at homes? Where are they looking? What are their what are their feelings on pricing and, and negotiations and everything else that we've talked about? And if I feel that hey, these guys are they're not serious. They're not ready. Their time frame is not in line with, you know, oh yeah, we're kind of, we want to go look at houses, but I don't need to be in a house until April of 2022. Okay. Well, it's June 4th. So we're not get we're not looking at houses now. <laughs> you know, you've got the internet for that. So. <laughs> you got all kinds of <laughs> top lines. You got the internet for that. Um, yeah, we do. I, I think what you both shared is super relevant because I know there's a lot of agents watching right now and they're like, my goodness, to Jess's point, I've got to be bringing properties to market. And if I'm spending all my time and energy serving buyers who aren't really, who aren't really able to compete in this current marketplace, mm -hmm. then I'm not running my business and I'm not serving my clients well because I'm giving my attention to folks who aren't really in the market. I think about an, all, an old Tom Tool line. This was meant for sellers, but now it applies to buyers. He used to say, you're either on the market or in the market. Which one is it? Yeah. Um, with sellers. And it's the same as true with buyers. Are you on it or in it? Because there's a big difference. And I think as an agent, you have to be realistic and say, are they on it or in it? I tell a lot of our buyers when we start out, you're going to have to lose out on two or three offers before you win one. You're going to have to taste defeat before you get victory. Because it's not, unless you're a hunter and you're all in, you're not winning anything. Yeah. All right, man. This This was supposed to be a 20 minute recording but you all came really ready <laughs> to rock them, sock them today. So I am grateful for both of you. Well, do you have more? <laughs> Was there more to share, <laughs> Jess? <laughs> y'all were, were great. Um, okay, That's so awesome. tell them again, where can they connect with you online? Jess, you first. Uh, JessicaThePike.ca and Live Love Play Halifax. All right, and then Brian, you? 
Yep, Brian Skates. You can find us on Instagram at, at Brian Skates or at our uh, website at skatesrealestate.com. Awesome. You guys were fantastic today. Thank you very much. Appreciate everybody watching. Sell some houses, get some contracts accepted. Talk to y'all next time. Bye.